Awesome. Okay, so I won't do any further ado. Uh, Nick Gibson. Gibson, where are you? Hiding. Come on up here. Has already given us microphone lessons, and now we're here to talk about music compression. Sir. Thank you. Thank you, Jason. Jason, everybody. <laughs> oh, yeah, I need that, don't I? All right. Uh, question number one for everybody. Uh, does anyone here like music? Good, good. Anybody here love music? Love music. Does anybody here not like music? Nobody. Good. Good. That's what I'm hoping to hear. Um, my name is Nick Gibson. I'm a sound guy. And I am here to talk about your music. Um, not just your specific songs, but I want to talk about how you listen to your music. Uh, and as soon as I get my notes back up here, we are going to get advanced with this slide. I hope it advances. There we go. We want to talk about your music and how you listen to it. This is uh, my friend Alice. Uh, Alice is going to help me out a little bit this evening uh, with some demonstrations. Uh, the first demonstration of which is my lack of drawing skills. Uh, the next thing is we're going to talk about how music gets digitized. Because what's the most popular way, the most popular music format in the world right now? Digital. Digital music. The flack is close. Uh, we're going to talk about how it gets digitized. We're going to talk about why it's digitized. We're going to talk about the limits of human hearing and how they are related. We're going to talk about how and why music gets compressed and why MP3s are very likely about the last thing you want to use to listen to your music. We're going to talk about why an 80s folk artist is responsible for every MP3 on your music player. Yes. Uh, We're going to finally talk about what fucking buttons to push in iTunes. <laughs> That's the important part of this talk, as a matter of fact. Uh, also, full disclosure, there will be a drinking game. So, Alice loves music. Alice loves all her music. She wants all of her music with her all the time. Uh, she's old school. She has a huge collection of CDs. She happens to like physical media. Uh, the other reason she is old school is because she is, pragmatically speaking, uh, well, uh, pragmatically speaking, CDs have an exceptionally high fidelity to the original sound. It's really, actually, CDs are a good bang for the buck. Are there higher fidelity versions available of music? Yes, you can ask me in the Q&A. But all in all, CDs are really a good deal. Alice is a pragmatist. She knows she can't carry all 1,500 of her CDs with her at all times, so what does she do? She goes, she buys herself a 64 gig iPhone, and she starts ripping her CDs in full AIFF, uncompressed, pristine condition to her, her iPhone, and after about 100 CDs, she runs out of room. What's she gonna do? Until they invent a terabyte iPhone, she's kind of out of luck there. She wants them to sound great, but she wants them all to fit. Well, Alice, have you never heard of MP3s? <laughs> it's not the devil's work, it is somebody else's work. And we need compression, unfortunately. So let's start back at the beginning. The first step to listening to your music better is know what you're listening to, which is not what song you're listening to, what sounds you're listening to. Alice ideally wants to listen to her music in a format that is as close as possible to the way that the artist created it, the way they recorded it, they pressed it, they mastered it, and they put it out for people to listen to. Well, CDs happen to capture that really, really well. So starting at the beginning, let's have an example. Uh, uh, and Alice, would you pick a song for us to listen to? Tom's Diner by Suzanne Vega from her 1986 uh, Solitude Standing album. In case you're not familiar with it, it sounds like this. 
I am sitting in the morning at the diner on the corner. I am waiting at the counter for the man to pour the coffee, and he fills it only halfway. Right. And before I eat, all right, good enough. So imagine it's 1986. Suzanne Vega has just recorded her album, and she's recorded onto two-inch magnetic tape. And an engineer takes that tape and he puts it through an audio or an, an analog to digital converter using a process called pulse code modulation. Now, that gives us this. This is digitized audio, or it's a picture of digitized audio. As a matter of fact, it is this digitized audio. Drinking. Uh oh. Where's my drink? Hold on. I hope that one's mine. Sorry. In case you didn't catch that, I said. Drinking. Right. Thank you. So, that's the word drinking. <laughs> Thank you. So, the engineer has digitized files of Suzanne Vega's songs. He takes that. And he transfers it to a CD at 44k 16-bit, and we have CDs. Everybody knows 44k 16-bit. CDs are CDs are 44k 16-bit. We all know that. What is that? What the hell is 44k 16-bit? Well, let's see if we can find out exactly what that entails. We are plotting to the we're plotting the sound wave on a graph, and those two numbers are really important when we're making. A CD or digitized audio. The x-axis, our time axis, is 44,100 samples per second. That's our 44.1k samples. Uh, the y-axis is our 16-bit. That is a number from not from uh, sorry, 16-bit is not from zero to 15. It is to 65,536. So that's our two important numbers, x and y-axis. 44,100 samples per second. Remember, video is only 30 frames a second. This is a little bit more accuracy to measure a sound wave. So, in the real world, at this resolution, this is about one five hundredth of a second of the word drinking. And at this resolution, you can see the actual sound points. <laughs> That's a whole different game. <laughs> you can see the actual uh, uh, sample points at this resolution that are recreating the shape of our sound wave. So why 44,100 of them? Did somebody just at some point say, "Oh, we need a crapload of them. Let's just do that"? They were a little more specific than that. There's one reason is that it had to do with、uh, technical standards between videotape manufacturers. Uh, or video machine manufacturers at the time that needed a, a, a standard that fit between European and American machines, but we don't care about that. We care about one other thing. It is called the Shannon Nyquist theorem. The Shannon Nyquist theorem is a sampling theorem that tells us how many samples we need. Specifically, it says that if a function x t contains no frequencies higher than b cycles per second, then it is completely determined by giving its ordinates at a series of points spaced one over two b seconds apart. Now, if you just tuned out on that, like Alice did, I don't blame you. So let's put that in a little more simple terms that everybody can understand. What this theorem is telling us is that we need, at minimum, two samples per cycle. Of a wave, in order to be able to measure it and recreate it perfectly, all we need is two samples in a wave to recreate it perfectly. So, at its extreme, half of the sample rate will be the highest frequency or cycle of sound that it's possible to perfectly reproduce. <laughs> right? So, when CD standard was created, we settled on 44.1 thousand samples per second to give us a frequency response of what? Anybody? Twenty-two thousand, twenty-two thousand point zero five. Well, twenty-two thousand and oh yeah, yeah. Well, you know what I mean. That's our frequency. That's the highest frequency we can measure in、uh, in pulse code modulation. Has anyone ever heard twenty-two thousand hertz?、Uh, I doubt you have. Probably. Does anyone know what the the、uh, assumed range of human hearing is? What are we? Pretty close. Well, yeah, we'd say that. 
Um, Alice knows. We usually say it's about 20 hertz to 20,000 hertz. That's the assumed range of human hearing. Now, has anyone ever heard 20,000 hertz? Do we know what that really means? Well, we are going to find out. Here's our playlist for right now. It looks like this. More importantly, it sounds like this. Uh, I had some time beforehand, so I can tell you that even if you don't hear anything uh, shortly, there is a sound playing. And the first thing we're going to listen to, we're going to start low. This is a sine wave at 14 kilohertz. I can tell most of you can hear that, which is good. Does any, did anybody not hear that just now? OK, good. Uh, maybe soup. <laughs> I'm sorry, soup. All right, let's do 15 kilohertz. If it's painful, good for you. Your hearing is great. Some people are going, hear what? In which case, I'm sorry to tell you, you do have some hearing damage. Most people have ever been to concerts. You probably do. 16 kilohertz. Congratulations. You have great hearing. Some people are going, I don't hear anything. That's about the limit of my hearing. This is 17. I expect not many people will hear this. It's playing. Some people are shaking their heads going, I don't know. <laughs> I guarantee you. There is sound playing. This is our one. This is our highest one. I'm going to play. This is 18 kilohertz. If anybody hears this sound, raise your hand when it starts. Very good. Congratulations. You have really good hearing at this point. Uh, on the low end, I'm sorry. We we can only play one on the low end. This is 45 hertz. That's getting toward the low end. Now, I would like to play you 30, 30 hertz, except that I can tell you that this sound system can't actually reproduce this sound. So it's not actually playing. Uh, if the train went by, we might actually get something in that frequency range, but it's hard to tell. So I'm sorry, we have to skip this bit because our sound system is actually not capable of producing sounds that low, which means our hearing can hear stuff really low. Below 20 hertz, you don't really hear it so much as feel it. But in any case, now you know. When we are measuring something in pulse code modulation, PCM, CD, we are measuring all of that from the lowest to the highest stuff we can't even perceive is all in there, which is great, which is also kind of bad. Because pulse code modulation uses a lot of data. They are really big files. Uh, as you all well know, um, uh, 10 megabytes per minute of stereo music, uh, 100 minutes of stereo music takes up a gigabyte, which is why they're huge, which is why it doesn't help Alice fit all of her music onto her iPhone. So enter the MP3. Finally, let's flash back to the 1980s. Back when the internet was a baby, people still wanted to send music files to one another. But the problem was, in the 80s, computer storage was really what? Expensive. It was really expensive for any kind of size. And data transmission bandwidth was really slow. If anyone remembers 14K modems, it would take you all day to send a single song to somebody else over the internet. It's true. Now, we could try to make those files smaller. We could cut the sample rate. We could, uh, you know, make the sample rate smaller. Oh, there's some, uh, some 25 hertz. Um, if we make the sample rate smaller, though, we're also going to reduce our frequency range. So if we cut our sample rate from 44.1 to down to 22 samples, well, now we're only measuring up to 11 thousand hertz. So what would that sound like? It cuts off all the high end. Here's I am sitting in the morning at the diner on the corner. I am waiting well, that's the same the song, for the man to pour but the it stops at 11k. There is nothing above that. It sounds a little bit even duller. It sounds a little bit um, window muffled if you had that compared. 
Now, the other thing we could do is reduce the bit rate. Instead of 16 bits and all those bits, we could use just 8 bit. Now, that doesn't just cut it in half, actually. We are reducing it uh, exponentially because uh, 2 to the 8th is only 256. So we've only got, instead of 65,536, we're only up to 256. What's the problem with that one? Well, unfortunately, that introduces a lot of noise. I am sitting in the morning like at hiss. the diner on the corner. Kind of crunchy stuff. I am waiting at the that's counter eight bit. for the man to pour the coffee. And that's clearly not acceptable either. So we need another solution. This, fortunately, is our man Karl Heinz Brandenburg. And back in the mid 1980s, Karl Heinz, yeah, yeah, Alice is digging it. Uh, and he was a PhD student in Nuremberg, Germany, and he was urged by his professors to develop a way to efficiently transmit music files over data lines, phone lines, ISDN. And everybody knows normal data compression like ZIP or RAR does not work on PCM files. So Karl Heinz starts developing a compression method based on perceptual coding that minimizes the PCM data according to what properties of sound are most important to human beings. Uh, it's, it relies on a principle called masking, uh, which is the brain's tendency to prioritize certain sounds over other sounds. Masking is a big thing in MP3. It's not backwards masking like, like, like Led Zeppelin or the Beatles or uh, whoever. If you want to talk about back masking, we will talk about that in the Q&A. Uh, however, in, in perceptual coding, uh, for instance, a hand clap in a silent room might seem kind of loud, but a hand clapped right after a gunshot might not seem so loud. So we can adjust the bits. The, a loud guitar in a song might be momentarily drowned out by a particularly loud cymbal crash, or a person speaking at nerd night might be drowned out by a train outside. That's masking. The sound is still there, but it's masked. And PCM, uh, PCM uh, digitizing saves all the sound, whether we hear it or not. So Carl Heinz applies the psychoacoustics of masking. The compression assigns fewer bits to those sounds that are masked. So it introduces distortion, but it's distortion we're not going to notice because you can't hear it. It's limited to those masked elements, and it's imperceptible on the playback. And it throws away some sounds that we can't hear at all. So Carl Heinz worked really, really hard to optimize his algorithm so that it could compress music of all kinds, and to still sound great, and make them smaller at the same time. And to do that, he tuned his algorithm using a, a few specific pieces of music, one of which was Tom's Diner by Suzanne Vega. Why? Karl Heinz said he chose this song because it was nearly monophonic in nature, has a wide spectral content, and it made it easy for him to hear the imperfections in his coding algorithm. He said uh, that at, by this point, nearly all the other music that he had tested out on his algorithm sounded pretty OK. But when he put this song through his algorithm, it destroyed it. It sounded terrible. Because what is the human ear tuned to hear? The sound of the human voice. And so it made it easy for him to find out what was wrong with his algorithm. And he worked at it. He tried different psychoacoustic models until he finally fixed his encoding. Drinking. Thank you. <laughs> hmm. And it was finally standardized as MPEG-1 layer 3. So when an MPEG-3 encoder encodes your music, it is replicating the way that Karl Heinz Brandenburg heard Suzanne Vega's voice going through his algorithm. Every MP3 is imitating that process. And the result is something that sounds a lot like the original. This is a, a, a sort of a before and after. You can see there's a slight change to the sound wave as it goes through the encoding from wave to MP3. It sounds a lot like the original. It's a lot smaller data-wise. And by necessity, the MP3 is less accurate. So let's compare. Let's find out. I'm going to play you Tom's Diner two more times. One of them is the original uncompressed. The other one 
is Carl Heinz Brandenburg's 128K MP3 encoding. I'm going to play them both. Don't say anything until you've heard them both. Just I'm going to play just like part of the first verse. See if you can decide which one is the original and which one is the MP3. I am sitting in the morning at the diner on the corner. I am waiting at the counter for the man to pour the coffee. And he fills it only halfway and before. Before I even argue, he is looking out the window at somebody coming in. Here's the next one. It is. I am sitting go. in the morning at the diner on the corner. I am waiting at the counter for the man to pour the coffee. And he fills it only halfway. And before I even argue, he is looking out the window at somebody coming in. There you go. Now, who thinks that last one I played was the MP3? Okay, and who thinks that it was the uh, CD version? Wow, we are about split. All right, I was hoping for a better response. I'm going to blame the fact that we have a limited sound system and a loud train outside and a band playing next door. But I'm going to tell you, the first one was the MP3. The second one was the original CD. <laughs> now we're going to fight. As a matter of fact, what's really interesting is I can play the difference between those two files. Uh, there's a guy on the, uh, on the internet, thanks to Mr. Ryan McGuire, who actually uh, did a, a, an interesting extraction to play, to find out the stuff that's missing from the MP3 file. Here's what we removed from the original to get to the MP3. It sounds like this. He calls it the ghost of the music. This is what's been removed. Anyway, I thought that was interesting. So, finally, we know what it is we're listening to. We even know how we're listening to it. The question is, what should we listen to? Well, not MP3s, actually. Why? Karl Heinz Brandenburg and his team at the Fraunhofer Institute didn't stop when they came up with MP3s. They kept working, and they came up with an improved successor. They came up with AAC, Advanced Audio Coding, or a codec. It uses a different algorithm, but it uses all the same principles of masking, and it is better than MP3s at the same bit rate. So a 128K AAC file is better than an MP3 at the same bit rate, same size. AAC will sound better. It's more advanced. All right. Get out your notebooks. If you really want to know what buttons to push in iTunes, this is kind of going to help explain it for you. So the first are our lossy options. Lossy is an actual term. We use the term lossy because we are losing information when we compress files like this. Using MP3 or AAC or AUG or WMA, they're lossy. Stuff that's lost can never be returned, but we won't notice it, hopefully. AAC is better than MP3. So in your iTunes setting, use the iTunes Plus at 256K, and I guarantee you it will sound almost as good as your CDs every time. Most of you will probably never be able to hear the difference. It's a great option. It really is very good. AUG is the same as AAC, more or less, except it is open source. If you're an open source fan, great, use AUG. There's not a lot of players that will actually play AUG on your phones, unfortunately, but you can find some. WMA is the Windows proprietary version of AAC. But good luck finding a player that plays WMA files. It's good, though. It's just not very popular. Then second, we have our lossless options. There are two. There is FLAC and there is Apple lossless. And by lossless, I mean we don't lose any information. We do make the files smaller. But we don't lose any information through an amazing transformative process. It is lossless. You will have a perfect copy of your music, but half the size, well, roughly half the size. So Apple Lossless and FLAC are great options. If you've got a hard drive that has a lot of room, you can still store a lot of music on it and not lose any information. It's really a pretty good option. So finally, Alice knows. 
what she needs to do to get the maximum music with the minimum space. And now you know the secrets to listening to your music better. And we've proved some of you, at least, will be able to hear the difference, even if you don't. Even if you didn't, didn't hear the difference. Try it yourself with headphones and, and a better sound file, you know? Treat yourself. You deserve it. Drinking. Thank you. Any questions? Yes, please. Oh, well, I, or I can repeat it. I don't know. You want to say? No. Hi, I was just wondering if you can do a follow-up sometime about speakers versus types of headphones. Because if you have good audio compression but shitty headphones, I've heard it doesn't make a difference. Good speakers or lousy headphones, it will, what you're listening to it on does make a difference, obviously. Yeah, and, and we have a pretty good sound system in here, but you know, we have limited resources to make this work, so. But yeah, I mean, if you have crappy headphones, you know what? I'm going to go out on a limb and say, even if you have crappy headphones, you'll still hear the difference between a good sound file and a lousy sound file. The better your headphones, the more that will be apparent. That's about all I can tell you. Um, why don't I just repeat the questions, if I could? Vinyl. The quality of vinyl. Uh, actually, some vinyl is of terrific quality. When, it is, uh, when, it, when uh, uh, a, a, a studio or an artist has actually prepared that music to be put on vinyl specifically, uh, there's there's a, a great amount of artistry that goes into vinyl and some vinyl sounds great It's not necessarily better or worse than CDs. It is definitely different and people prefer something that sounds different So it's fine. Some people prefer vinyl just because of how it sounds. It's not that it's better or worse but there's also some vinyl out there that basically they uh, in the in the, uh, the the record companies take the CD master and they burn that onto vinyl which really doesn't give you anything at all. As a matter of fact, it's probably worse to listen to on vinyl that way. So it depends a lot on the artist or the label or uh, you know the individual uh, recording. The older the the older it is, yes. The question, <laughs> thank you, Tom. Uh, the question is the is the older the better vinyl? In a lot of ways, yes. Although sometimes even vinyl that was originally made from analog sources was lousy back then too. Some of it is still terrific, was terrific then, it is terrific now. So it depends really what you like to listen to. Anybody else? Yes. So the, do I have anything to say about the, the proprietary Apple lossless format? Uh, in short, it is lossless, which means, but how is it smaller? It is lossless, but how is it smaller? FLAC and Apple lossless. Um, I don't know exactly who it is that developed it, but I'm going to say that what they promise is true, is the fact that they have managed to find a way to compress the PCM data, the full PCM data, into a smaller file size. Uh, unfortunately, I can't tell you exactly how. But it's a great option. So do I think that now that uh, storage space is becoming cheaper and cheaper, that eventually we'll just go back to full uncompressed music or, or higher, higher fidelity music? Um, I think the more that we have that option, the better. Uh, just being able to keep stuff in, in uncompressed, full lossless format is a big improvement. And if you've got a, you know, a three terabyte drive at home, then yes, save everything as FLAC or Apple lossless. You can store tons of it. When you want to put it on your music player, great, go down to AAC. Um, most people, in fact, I'm willing to say virtually no one can hear the difference between a 44-1 16-bit recording and a 96K 24-bit recording. 
in blind A-B tests, no one has been shown to be able to tell the difference between that high of a, of a uh, quality file and just normal CD standard. That doesn't mean that the, an A-B blind test is the right way to test whether that's possible because obviously audiophiles will argue, oh yes, that they, they can tell the difference. And it is possible eventually to find out if that's true. Uh, for the average listener, no. For the average person, no. People generally cannot tell the difference between CD format and anything of greater resolution. Uh, extreme audiophiles will argue that with me and they're welcome to. <laughs> yes? Right, yeah, the, 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 well, if I could repeat it, I would tell people that it was, uh, the question was about, what about 48K recordings instead of 44.1? Well, that gives you a frequency response up to 24 kilohertz. And I don't think anybody else can hear 24 kilohertz any better than they could hear the 22 kilohertz or the 20 kilohertz, or actually really in our case, even the 18 kilohertz. Uh, so that much higher resolution between 44.1 and 48, I would not pay any extra money for it personally. And I'd be surprised if anyone could hear the difference in a blind test. That's just me. Yes. Ah. <laughs> our, our friend here didn't hear any of the, uh, the high frequency tones that we played. You didn't hear anything from 14K, 15K, 16K. In which case, I'm sorry to inform you, do you do have some hearing loss? Right. Should a person with some hearing loss really then care that much about whether it's MP3 or CD and that's kind of a personal choice because yeah I mean if you just don't hear frequencies above that it's not going to make a whole lot of difference however there are other parts of the music that you may discover sound different uh, the the resolution of what I always tend to notice in mp3s bad mp3s specifically is the sound of the drums sometimes they just sound weird the cymbals sound like they don't sound clear they sound a little warbly uh, we also lose a little bit of the low end in some mp3s as well and you probably can hear the low end probably much better than the highs so for someone with hearing loss it may make less of a difference but I'm not gonna say it's not gonna make no difference I would encourage you to try to find out but don't spend a lot of money on it I guess <laughs> anybody else yes What are the differences between AAC and MP3? Um, it's really hard to describe the exact differences in the algorithm uh, because I, well, technically I don't even understand the differences. All I can tell you is that Brandenburg did manage to continue to refine his algorithms. He kept, like I said, he kept working on them. And when they found out, oh, well, wow, we're keeping more of the same information. We're keeping more of the original information and making it sound better with keeping the sound file at the same size. So unfortunately, I can't really explain how he did it. But I can tell you that it, that it was an improvement. So if you have a choice, use AAC. All right. Wait, don't go anywhere. We have... We had a lot of entrance. <laughs> you have a really good subject. They had too much time on their hands. They were, they were listening very closely. Uh, sounds like, sounds, sorry, like a good time. Entry one. Uh, next one, C. Dick and Jane Rock. <laughs> 44K 16-bit for dummies drinking with Suzanne Vega. 22,000 megahertz, so good. 525,000. <laughs> if you can hear this, you're too young to drink. <laughs> Someone's very old, uh, or goes to a lot of concerts. Alice and Psychoacoustics. Carl stalks Suzanne. 
I thought it was the other way around, really. Napster's Paradise. Ooh. Go ask Alice slash ask Alice the musical. Uh, and finally, I meant we keep spending most of our lives living in a Napster's Paradise. <laughs> Your selection, sir. Wow. Wow. Those were really good. I'm impressed. Uh, I, I really like the Napster, both Napster ones. Uh, but I have, I, I have to say the one that made me laugh the most was 525,600 <laughs> kilohertz. Jacob, Jake, drink. Give it up for Nick Gibson. Thanks very much, sir.